west of Chesapeake Bay, on the Maryland side of the Potomac River, sits the half-sunken and decomposing remnants of the largest shipwreck fleet in the Western Hemisphere. Following the end of the First World War, hundreds of United States vessels were sent here, fated to be destroyed and scrapped. To this day, many can still be seen, existing as abandoned relics of the early 20th century. This is the story of the ghost fleet of Mallows Bay. The story begins on April 2nd, 1917, when President Woodrow Wilson issued a national call to arms against Imperial Germany, abandoning the United States' previous position of neutrality regarding the ongoing war in Europe. Europe was reeling from the devastating effects of Germany's unrestricted submarine warfare over the previous two and a half years, and now that the United States had joined the fight, it was necessary to move nearly everything required for waging war, personnel, arms, and supplies, across the dangerous and submarine-occupied Atlantic. Between the years of 1899 and 1915, United States shipyards had launched only 540,000 tons of blue water shipping. Now, to maintain a large army in Europe and counter the losses caused by submarine warfare, the United States would need to build 6 million tons in only 18 months. This effort would require the United States' most aggressive and innovative shipbuilding program in history, surpassing by 50% the total production of the Western world between 1899 and 1915. In February 1917, Frederick Augustus Eustace, an engineer and yachtsman, submitted a plan to William Denman, the chairman of the United States Shipping Board, that outlined a method to meet the emergency wartime need. Eustace called for establishment of a massive wooden shipbuilding program, which would be fast, cheap, and would not tie up the available shipyards that were already engaged in naval construction. After Denman received a blessing from President Wilson for the plan, the Shipping Board would form the Emergency Fleet Corporation, or EFC, to oversee the construction of these ships by private contractors, with General George W. Gothels, the famed builder of the Panama Canal, as its general manager. The initial plans had called for the launching of 1,000 wooden steamships within 18 months, each powered by 1,500 horsepower engines and capable of a maximum speed of 10 knots, with the sizes of 240 to 300 feet in length and up to 50 feet abeam. A standard design was drawn up by the EFC's chief naval architect, Theodore Ferris, and all vessels would follow this basic pattern. While massive orders of timber, frames, and hull planking were being placed by July 1917, a power struggle between Denman and Gothels over the direction of the program had held up approval for the first 433 vessels until October. It was a mess of bureaucracy and paperwork while opposition to the wooden steamship program was being fostered heavily by the steel industry. This led to the optimism of the EFC program being dampened. While the press reported on the program being mismanaged and responsible for creating vessels that were dangerously unseaworthy. By October 1918, only 134 of the ships had been completed, while another 263 were less than half finished. By the time that Germany surrendered on November 11th of 1918, not a single of the program's vessels had crossed the Atlantic. Following the war, an investigation into the program found out that of the 731 vessels contracted for, only 98 had been delivered. Of these, only 76 had carried cargo in trade, mostly in Pacific coastal waters. Despite the project's failures, ships would continue to be constructed following the war. By September of 1919, 264 ships had been placed in operation, out of which 195 had made an Atlantic passage, with 40 of them making the journey more than once. However, for the vessels of the EFC program, their days were numbered.
The dismal post-war world economy and resultant abundance of shipping soon resulted in what was known as the Great 1920 Tie-Up. The subsequent introduction of the diesel engine around this time had also rapidly made the reciprocating steam plants of the wooden fleet obsolete. On December 27th of 1920, the shipping board moved to dispose of what certain critics had called the grandest white elephant ever produced, 285 subpar and leaking wooden and steel composite ships. Most of the fleet was mothballed in Virginia's James River, with two tugs and an army of men keeping them afloat at a cost of $50,000 per month. This mothball fleet that had cost American taxpayers of the time $700,000 to $1 million per vessel was offered up for sale as a single unit sold as is and where is. While the government repeatedly called for bids, they also happened to reject each one as too low. Finally, in September of 1922, 233 of the fleet's ships were sold for $750,000 to an Alexandria, Virginia-based firm, the Western Marine and Salvage Company, or WMNSC. The firm's primary objective was to scavenge the ships for marketable scrap metal. WMNSC immediately sought permission from the War Department to haul the fleet from the James to the Potomac, where it would be kept at a 1,500-acre government-authorized mooring area off of Widewater, Virginia, 30 miles below Washington, D.C. From this mooring, each vessel would be individually towed to Alexandria to have its suitable machinery and other equipment removed for scrapping. After, the plan was to return it to its anchorage, where it would be burned to the waterline, stripped of remaining smaller fittings, then dragged to a nearby marsh, burned once again, and ultimately buried beneath dredge spoil. In October of 1922, the dismantling process began at Alexandria. The project suffered the first of its many setbacks almost immediately, when two vessels accidentally caught fire at Dockside, with the town's entire waterfront narrowly escaping total destruction. In the following April of 1923, five more vessels accidentally burned at Widewater, while later several untended ships drifted into the channel and sank. The project came to a halt as government investigators who were worried that the fleet would become a potential hazard for navigation demanded a full reappraisal of the program. Five months later, WM and SC submitted their revised plan, with a burning permit being issued shortly after. While local watermen had protested to the Secretary of Commerce, Herbert Hoover, that the appointed burning ground was also an important shad and herring fishery, their protests went unheeded. The first vessel to be purposefully burned was the steamer Aberdeen, and WM and SC's previous plans for disposal were a success, generally speaking. However, things would again become problematic soon thereafter. By mid-October, four vessels had been burned, but two were beached. The other two had sank, impairing local navigation. The local watermen once more argued their case, and by October 15th, when it was announced that as many as 218 vessels were to be destroyed at Widewater, the protests increased to the point of halting operations entirely. WM and SC was beginning to realize that they would have to acquire their own territory to use for burning the ships. And in April of 1924, the company bought 566 acres of farmland in a small remote area of the Maryland shoreline opposite of Widewater, known locally as Mallows Bay. Four marine railways, wharves, offices, storage facilities, and workers' dorms were built at Sandy Point on the northern lip of the bay to facilitate the removal and burial of the burned hulks. But problems for WM and SC persisted as local Maryland watermen also began protesting the use of Mallows Bay. By now, the company was faced with huge expenditures and had yet to turn a profit. The Navy shared their concerns about the operation as well, worried that the vessels were obstructing navigation and might block egress from the Washington Navy Yard. The company was forced to act dramatically. On November 7th of 1925, 31 vessels were bound together in a line by a steel cable, and at 5 a.m. just before sunrise, with government representatives and press lurking nearby in tugs and motorboats, on a signal, 10 men raced along the ship's decks, lighting oil-soaked waste with flaming torches. While this caused quite a stir, especially for the local marines who were not notified of the planned blaze and had raced to qualify, 
the program for disposing of the ships was more or less back on track. As the years went on, the company's sales from the salvage materials had failed to keep pace with the costs. By August of 1929, WMNSC had brought a total of 169 ships from the EFC fleet into Mallows Bay for destruction and salvage. Then came the great stock market crash in October of 1929, and the price of scrap had plunged. With the worsening depression, WMNSC's losses became severe. In March of 1931, it would finally shut down operations, and by the following year, it had lapsed into bankruptcy. The wrecks of Mellows Bay were left unattended and without a plan for their disposal. In December of 1934, a local circuit court ruled that the hulks now belonged to no one and could therefore be salvaged by anybody. Nearly every day thereafter, scores of independent salvagers could be witnessed dynamiting and picking over the carcasses of the fleet. This would lead to a cottage industry in scrap salvage springing up along the Mallows Bay shoreline, eventually accounting for at least 15% of the local income of the adjacent Charles County. Before we dive deeper into what became of the Ghost Fleet, I'd like to cover some brief history and stories that I was able to find regarding some of the wrecks in Mellows Bay. The first of note is the newest addition to the Ghost Fleet, the SS Akamek. I hope I'm saying that right. The Akamek is the only steel hold vessel in Mellows Bay and is the most modern ship design amongst the fleet. The Akamek served as a car ferry connecting Norfolk to Virginia's eastern shore prior to the construction of the Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel in 1964. She remained in operation until suffering a fire and being taken out of commission. Later, the Akamek was brought to Mallows Bay in 1973. The next mention is the Benzonia, 1919 steamship built in Washington State. For a short period, the Benzonia was engaged in the war effort, but was sold to WM&SC in 1922, where she later came to rest with the Ghost Fleet. In 2003, Hurricane Isabel lifted the Benzonia wreck atop another World War I steamship, the Caribou. Later, a mysterious fire would catch in her stern section. Another is the SS Boone a wood and steel ship named by the wife of President Woodrow Wilson and launched in August of 1918 in the presence of 3,000 spectators. The Boone's career, like the other hastily built vessels of the war, was unfortunately quite brief. Like hundreds of others, she was sold for scrap in 1922 and brought to Mallows Bay. Then we have the Yawa, a merchant vessel. She's documented as making at least one European voyage to Genoa, Italy in late 1919. She was later laid up in the James River during the Great Tie-Up of 1920, eventually being purchased at auction by WMNSC, leading to her permanent resting place in the bay. Next is the Bayou Tech. On July 4th, 1918, she was one of 94 ships to take to the waters in the greatest single ship launch in world history. Bayou Tech made several voyages to Havana, Cuba, Galveston, Texas, and Bordeaux, France. Then we have the Casmalia, named after a location in California. Casmalia's career, like those of her sister ship, was short. Today she lies at the northern end of Mallows Bay, beside an unidentified wooden steamship. Another is the Mono, which was among the 94 U.S. shipping board ships that came from the EFC program, being launched like the Bayou Tech on July 4th, 1918. She was put to work on the San Francisco Hawaiian Islands Pineapple Run, later being prematurely retired and brought to rest in the bay around 1929. Another mention is the SS Afrania, which was said to have made at least one known transatlantic voyage to Royan, France, from which she sailed on a return voyage to Norfolk, Virginia in 1919. Then we have the North Bend, named after a town in Oregon. 
She was the earliest U.S. shipping board wooden steamer completed and certified during the EFC program. She was placed in the trade between the Pacific Coast and Hawaiian Islands, carrying general merchandise and sugar. And here we have the Coconino, the fifth of the first six ships contracted by the EFC and launched on June 22nd of 1918. Laden with lumber, Coconino was towed into San Francisco where the Matson Line employed her on the Pineapple Run from San Francisco to Hawaii during the sugar season of 1918. And this is the Kickapoo. Launched at North Bend, Oregon in 1918 where she was assigned to the Matson Line again from San Francisco to Hawaii for the sugar run. During her career she sailed trade routes to Chile and France and most notably traveled to Black Sea ports in 1919 to bring humanitarian necessities to Armenian and Russian refugees between the White Russian and Red Bolshevik armies in the post-war conflict. Nearby to the Kickapoo is the Marshfield, one of 17 Hugh ships employed by the Matson Line for the Pineapple Run. She made nine such voyages, hauling coal, sugar, and pineapples until January of 1920. Also, we have the Alsis, a historic Ferris-type single crew steamship, one of the many produced during the EFC program. Little is known about the ship's history before it was purchased at auction by WMNSC in 1922. Our next stop is the Congaree, named after the Congaree River in South Carolina. On August 13th of 1929, she was substituted for the steamship Wanayanda in a bond for burning. The Congaree was among those subjected to dynamiting at Mallows Bay between 1930 and 1940. Nearby also is the Guilford, the only known Maryland-built U.S. shipping board wreck that exists in Mallows Bay. Also close by is the Nemasa. The Nemasa sailed from Portland, Maine to Baltimore, Maryland in 1919. Shortly after her arrival, she sank mid-channel in the Patasco River after taking aboard a 3,000-ton cargo of coal. Eventually, she was raised, repaired, and placed back in service to finish her short trip to Italy. She received additional repairs in Europe before setting sail for America, just in time to be scrapped at Mallows Bay. Next is the Belgrade. Like many of the vessels at Mallows Bay, the EFC sold her at auction to WM and SC. She was stripped of her engine, prop, and metal fittings at Alexandria and ended her short life in the bay, assigned Army Engineers Hull number 148. Casota was named after a town in Minnesota and launched in March 1918 in Portland, Oregon. Casoto was assigned by the shipping board as one of the 22 vessels to join the Pacific Mail Steamship Company fleet based in San Francisco. She was also assigned to the San Francisco-Hawaii route, carrying coal and returning with sugar. Like many others in the EFC, her career was brief. Another collection of wrecks consists of three vessels known today as the Three Sisters. The first of the vessels is the Dertona, who was briefly in the coasting trade with her travels documented in maritime columns of numerous national newspapers. The next nearby vessel is known as the Heron Wreck, another vessel from the EFC fleet brought to the bay for scrapping. She's known by this name due to the frequent sightings of blue herons around the site, with little other information regarding her career. The other of this group is the Musabi, which is just a probable identity of the wreck. In 1919, the steamer Musabi took on a cargo of 1.5 million feet of timber log ties at St. Helens, Oregon, bound for England. In May 1920, she was engaged for a voyage from Norfolk, Virginia to France, where she unloaded her cargo and took on another for her return voyage to Norfolk in July of 1920. Again, she was also sold at auction and brought to the bay. The last I have to mention is the Sea Scout. Information is even more vague on this one, but it's suggested she may have been a U.S. Coast Guard patrol vessel or a Navy patrol torpedo boat that was sold out of service after the Second World War. While Mallows Bay is home to around 200 shipwrecks, some dating as far back as the Civil War, 
Many of the stories of these ships seem to be somewhat forgotten or with very little information available, at least from what I've seen documented online. The majority of the still visible wrecks are comprised of the vessels from the EFC program during the First World War. Though wrecks like the Benzonia, Akamek, Yawa, and Boone are among the more prominent in the bay. I'm sure there are much more detailed accounts about more of the ships out there, but I wasn't able to find much more online worth covering here. If any of you watching know a good article source containing more in-depth coverage of the individual ships, feel free to let me know in the comments section. I would love to read it. Now let's move on to what became of the fleet during the Second World War and in the decades after. As the Second World War began, scrap metal prices began to rise exponentially. And in June of 1940, the federal government established the Metals Reserve Company to stockpile necessary materials. This included spending around $200,000 on a project aimed at recovering 20,000 tons of iron from 110 of the hulls still lying in Mallows Bay. The Bethlehem Steel Corporation was hired to manage the effort. The project began taking on industrial proportions, with Bethlehem excavating a huge enclosed marine basin by closing the gates and pumping out the water, later burning the hulks down completely, leaving only their remaining metal fittings. This process proved to be too exhausting and expensive even for Bethlehem. And by the end of 1943, the company had spent $360,000 and fewer than a dozen vessels had been successfully burned down, with the amount of usable material salvaged being minimal. By September of 1944, Bethlehem completely shut down its operations in Mallows Bay. Following nearly two decades of efforts to salvage and dispose of the remains of the EFC fleet, all activity had ceased at the site leaving the ghost fleet to remain undisturbed for the next 20 years. In 1963, a group of local watermen, as well as a real estate firm called Idemont Incorporated, instigated a removal effort of the holes from the bay. With the support of Governor Spiro Agnew, the Army Corps of Engineers began a $350,000 removal effort, and in 1968, Congress, acting under a special provision of the Rivers and Harbors Act, ordered the hulks to be destroyed once again. The project and efforts would languish while congressional hearings disclosed revelations that would ultimately end the effort once again. It was discovered that Idemont Incorporated was little more than a straw corporation, or a front, employed by the Potomac Electric Power Company to acquire the Sandy Point tract for a massive coal-fired generating plant without having to go through the public disclosure or reveal its intentions to stockholders. The operations for removing the hulks at the expense of the government would have permitted unimpeded passage for coal barges. The company's actions were deemed as a clear violation of the Securities and Exchange Commission regulations, as well as state disclosure laws. The subsequent testimony by the Chesapeake Biological Laboratory, the National Auburn Society, and the Department of the Interior suggested that over the years, the wrecks had become integral components of the local environment. It was argued that removing the wrecks would contribute to pollution and severely damage the natural habitats of the life forms that had begun to repopulate the area after the trauma to the area in the previous decades. This would ultimately lead to all operations for the removal of the wrecks to be quietly shelved and forgotten. <laughs> In 2015, the bay was officially listed as an archaeological and historic district on the National Register of Historic Places, and in July of 2019, it was declared a National Marine Sanctuary. The excellent footage found today, taken by drone operators mostly, and shown intermittently throughout this video makes it clear that nature has completely reclaimed the wrecks, with many creatures now calling these old relics their home. I'm glad that the site's now protected, and learning about the history behind it was very fascinating to me, especially the available individual stories about the ships themselves, at least those that I could find. 
I know there are plenty of other videos and articles out there covering this topic, but hopefully you learned something new from this video or were at the very least entertained by the story. I would absolutely love to visit this site one day. I've been fascinated by ships and shipwrecks since I was a kid, and places like this have always been a subject of my imagination. That will do it for this story about the ghost fleet of Mallow's Bay. If you have anything you'd like to add, anything important I might have missed or gotten wrong, feel free to let me know in the comments section. If you enjoyed the story, give the video a like, it helps the channel a lot. Also consider subscribing, it's free after all, and I would love for this channel to grow. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope you'll visit again in the future for new videos. Until next time, take care.